I think our story, God, God brought us to this property. It was so clear that mm -hmm. we bought this property from a man I met in Jerusalem in yeah. 20, 2020. And his fingerprints are on the story, so it's, it's his leadership that's brought us this far. And it's going to be exciting to see why he brought us to this location mm -hmm. and uh, what we get to discover. Mm -hmm. I think too, it's between North Dallas and South Dallas. I think it's going to be a bridge between two mm -hmm. demographics that are incredibly divided. Mm -hmm. And I think this, to me, is a table for our city to come together. 
ultimately it's just a place where God rests when people come to encounter yeah. Him. Um, so it's going to be more the same. Uh, just this represents a larger space, yeah. which means more lives and souls. Yeah. There's more seats at so the table. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm stoked. The whole message of, hey, yeah, we're not just building buildings. I mean, we're, we're, this is something that literally is opening gateways to further the work in Estonia and Israel yeah. and the land and South America objectives. And, yeah. you know, there, we, I, I truly yeah. sense that as, as the obedience went from Oakland to here, I believe this is the same with the Lord. It's like He's saying, You've been so faithful in stewarding what you've given. Now I'm going to stretch you even more. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not any different, it's just larger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I see just a yes to step into it. Yeah. And even if it means we don't know everything, I don't think we knew everything when we moved over here, but it's just in that faith and that place of we trust Him. Yeah. We're moving in, and then it opens the doors to the things that we couldn't possibly fathom ever doing. Yeah. So that's kind of how I see it. Isaiah 54, he's extending the 10 pegs. Yeah. And yeah. it's a holy, sacred atmosphere it for is. him. So it is his house. Brick by brick. His presence. will not be like funds to build a building or the finished project. The miracle will be the glory of the Lord. The miracle will be the unity and the spirit of prayer that comes upon our body while we wait, while it's being built. The miracle will be the great unity and glory that will come to our house and so Lord, we want to say that it's worth the wait. Yes. It's worth the wait. While while they're over there with their their hammers and nails, Lord, we ask for your glory to fall. We ask for your glory to fall on us. We ask for a spirit of prayer to come upon us. Lord, we say thank you for that. We would much rather have your glory than bricks, God. Any time, any day. So that's what we ask for, God. I just feel the Holy Spirit saying, what if you knew that it was all going to be done? What would you ask for? And we would say, Lord, we would ask for you. We would ask for your glory. We would ask for you to fill it because what is a house if you're not in it, God? So come fill us while we pray. We invite, will you just extend your hands? Holy Spirit, let a spirit of prayer come upon me and come upon this house. Let your glory come upon me, a cloud, just like filled Solomon's temple, just like let the Israelites out, just like when Moses would meet with you at the tent of meeting, let a cloud come, let your glory come. Let a spirit of prayer come and let every other will bow to your will. Let every other longing bow to this longing, Lord. This is what we ask for and we thank you for it in Jesus' name.
Good morning, online community. Check, check, check. Good morning, online community. We are coming through the main speakers there for a second, but we wanted to welcome you to the upper room. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of our pastors here on staff. This is my daughter, Rosie. We are getting ready for Sunday morning service, and we're so glad that you are tuning in with us. And so we just wanted to welcome you. We wanted to thank you for joining us. Wanted to pray for you as we get started. And I also wanted to let you know that we're currently raising funds for our new building. So if you're part of our online community, you may not know we're moving to the other side of the city. We're currently building out a new building, and we need help. And so we wanted to ask you if you would consider giving to give to that. Uh, our desires to build a resting place for the Lord here in Dallas, Texas, a place where you guys can come and visit us and we can worship together in person. So if that would be a blessing to you, it would definitely bless us. But let me pray for you as we start this morning. So Lord, I thank you for our online community. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's tuning in from all across, not only the state uh, or the nation, Lord, but from the globe. And I just pray that what you're doing in this room, you would translate through the screen, Lord, through audio wavelengths, and you would touch people, God. I pray that your presence would touch our online community, Lord, that you would touch families, you would touch kids, you would touch marriages, Lord, in homes, in cars, in businesses, wherever they may be streaming from, Lord, would you touch them this morning? And we just declare that you would be blessed this this morning that you would encounter Jesus. We love you. Thank you for joining us. Not our way, not our plans, but your way. Your way.
please open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. See you one more time. Open the eyes. Open.
something fresh this morning Lord we offer you our love we offer you our devotion we offer you our hearts Lord, you are worthy to receive power and honor and glory oh we love you
put your hand on your heart. And uh, Lord, may this, may this heart be an altar with your flame, with your flame, Lord. As it says in Psalm 69, what filled your son, would it fill us? And it's zeal, Lord, your zeal. Lord, your love is a consuming fire. And all we know to do, Lord, is to present ourselves, to present our circumstances, our relationships, our fears. Lord, we present ourselves as we are. And we ask, Lord, for your love, your zeal to touch our hearts once again, Lord. Lord, you initiated this. Lord, you loved us first. Lord, you came to us. And Lord, as we're coming to you, we're reminded that you initiated us first. And so would you initiate our hearts again, God? Would you, would you set a fresh fire on the hearts of your people, God? Would you release a fresh zeal, Lord? Not our zeal, but your zeal, Lord. Your love, your desires, Lord. Your intentions, your will. Lord, all we know to do is to present ourselves this morning. And we say, here we are, Lord. You paid a lofty price, Lord, for us to approach you today. And so we renew our minds, Lord into this reality of who we're in and who is now in us. So let the flame of your fire, God, let it consume all that can be consumed right now. It's a song of deliverance. It's a song of surrender. It's a song of simplicity. It's a song of of alignment and coming back. To the one that has that fire and zeal still in his eyes. And so would you touch us with that once again, Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Would you grab your elements? Uh, the communion should be in your seat. Don't you love the worship team? I love that their their songbook is their Bible. (laughs) They were just singing scripture over us this morning. And uh, his, his love has been revealed. His love's been revealed. And these elements that you're holding, we believe this is the centerpiece of this morning. That Jesus Christ, he in his zeal and in his love for us, he met us in death so that we now could live with him in newness of life. And uh, we haven't read our our, uh, our table. This is a crafted prayer that we've made over the last probably 10, 12 years. And, um, and this just reminds us of what we have access to when we come to this table. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at this bread that you're holding. This is true food. This is true food. And this is the bread of life. And so what you're about to repeat with me, we're gonna read it together, are our promises that this meal provides. And if you run across something you need, if you're reading this and faith leaps into your heart, I want you to do this as we're reading it. I just want you to stand up as an act of faith that, Lord, I'm coming to this table and I'm finding what I need. It's it's a long prayer, so hopefully most of us will be standing by the end of this. But And would you read this? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. When you read this, read it with a smile. Put a smile on your face. This is the table that is set before us in the presence of our enemies. And I don't know what's surrounding you today, but I know that this meal is sufficient for whatever that is. So I don't see all of you smiling yet. Are you ready? Father, you can read it with me. Father, 
I thank you for this bread that is the body of your Son and my Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you took my sins, my cares, my worries, my sicknesses, and my diseases upon your body. Thank you that your body took on all that my body could not. Thank you that your body took up my infirmities, diseases, my chastisement, my affliction, my scourging, my rebellion, my iniquity, my transgression, my grief, my sorrow, my anguish, my guilt, my shame, my condemnation resulting in your body taking on my death. Father, I proclaim that you died my death. I proclaim that I was crucified with you and that I no longer live, but you live in me and the life I now live in the body. I live by faith because you gave your body for me. And now, glorious Father, I receive total healing and wholeness in my spirit, my soul, my mind, my emotions, and my body. This life, healing, and wholeness includes every organ, every cell, every joint, every ligament, every muscle, and every bone in my body. For any and every need, I receive total healing for every function in my body. And I give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. I bless your name, Father. I also declare that through this body, I am made one with you and I am made one with your people. I declare forgiveness, wholeness, and grace upon all my relationship, both family and friends. I take this over my marriage and declare oneness with my bride and that you are for our covenant and empowering us to love each other supernaturally and holy. I take this over my children and declare salvation for my house. I take this over the Upper Room family and declare oneness of heart, mind, and mission that we will truly experience the fullness of being called the body of Christ in every facet and form. Thank you for your precious body, Lord Jesus, broken for us. Receive his body this morning. Thank you, Lord. All right, you can be seated again because we're going to do the blood. <laughs> Come to the table. Some of you aren't fully smiling. I was watching. All right, this is what you're holding. The blood of Jesus. So we're going to read this as a family together. The Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. I just ate the body of Christ, and now I'm holding the blood of Christ, which represents your life. When I drink this, it will bring life to the body of Christ that I just ate. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this representation of the blood of Jesus. I realize I'm holding the most powerful substance in the universe. It is more powerful than all physical weapons, medicines, foods, bacteria, viruses, curses, and rebellious decisions that I've made. Come on. This blood has the power to deal fully with all my sin, both the power of sin in my life and ultimately one day the presence of sin in this world. Jesus, your blood was shed out at seven different areas of your body. Brow sweat, head, back, bruising, hands, feet, and side. These wounds supply for my renewed will, honor, healing, forgiveness, sanctification, renewed dominion, and intimate companionship. Thank you that this blood is for my past, present, and future sins, that this blood speaks a better word than any other word over my life. Thank you that this blood sets me free from any and all accusation against me. 
thank you that every demonic assignment, curse, and influence is rendered powerless because of your blood. Jesus, I thank you for shedding your blood at Calvary. I now receive your blood and a new and fresh and filling of your life and your spirit. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Receive the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Wow. Give someone a hug and tell them you love them. Woo. Bro. Somebody better slap somebody out of that. That was good. That's like, what's up? If you forgot what you have access to, faith comes by hearing. So that prayer is available to you. Uh, I think it's on our website, but just come to the table. Anyone at any time facing anything, the table is for you. Uh, I'm going to get our, our, our preacher up. She's my favorite preacher. Um, but we wanted to give a quick update on Gen Z for Jesus. So a, a, a week ago Saturday, uh, we had just under 8,000 registered to come to Gen Z for Jesus, which was in Southern California. It's crazy. I know. So when they were coming down, the, 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 the system actually malfunctioned, so we don't know how many actually were present, but it was a packed house. It was, someone said, can you describe Gen Z for Jesus? And I was like, it was like the body of Christ on Red Bull for 12 hours. It was just, people were, those young ones, man, they worship for 12 hours straight. And uh, I have a little clip here. We baptized 115 people. And so look at this, look at this clip. I think there were, there were a ton of upper rumors that flew to California that volunteered, um, whether it was baptisms or just ushering. And I want to thank you for supporting that event. Also financially, thank you for supporting that event. Get this. Um, so right next door to Angeles Temple where we were is Echo Park, which is a real famous park in uh, near downtown LA. Sunset Boulevard's right there. And so it can be a pretty uh, dicey place, just especially we were there Saturday night. And so some of the upper room team went and preached the gospel at Echo Park. And there were a handful of people that heard the gospel, gave their life to Jesus, and then came and were baptized into the waters, which was just super cool. Isn't that awesome? So uh, just so grateful for Marcella and Brian. And just it, it was a very, very powerful event. So I am deeply encouraged with what Jesus is doing in Gen Z and just our small little role that we get to play. Um, hey, my bride is going to preach this morning. So would you give it up for Larissa Miller? Hey, thanks. Good morning. Everyone say, what's up to Overflow? What's up, Overflow? We love you. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I got a lot that I felt the Lord wanted to say today. So let's pray. Put your hand on your heart. Jesus put eyes in there. He put eyes in there for you to see him. And um, we, were, we started off the day asking him. And um, I'm just remembering when he was resurrected and he visited the disciples in the upper room, it says, I'm going to read it to you while we're still praying, so just keep your eyes closed. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. It says, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So I want you to Look at Jesus right now and say, open my understanding. Open my understanding. 
Open my understanding. There is a supernatural reality, Lord, that we need that I cannot do, Jesus. I cannot do. You could make me the most gifted speaker on this planet and I cannot open the understanding. But you can by your spirit. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to fill this room, to fill our hearts. Let your zeal come and rip veils and give us fresh eyes. We want to see you. And Lord, you know that we have to see you. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, you can get your Bibles out. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to talk to you about endurance today. I've been thinking lately about what an undervalued value that is in the church to endure. Did you know that we are, we are encouraged to endure 32 times in the New Testament? The implication is that you will not want to endure. Can I just state the obvious? The obvious is that it's gonna be hard. Hey, come to church, it's gonna be really hard. <laughs> no, truly, there's a, the implication is you're gonna to wanna to give up. And the Bible says that in the last days that the love of many will grow cold, that people will want to throw in the towel. And so I've been asking the Lord to teach me about endurance. And so I want to share with you today, Hebrews 12, let's read together verses one, not together, let's look at it together, verses one through three. Although you guys are great readers, that, that prayer time was impressive, am I right? Wow. Um, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, they're here now. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on, let's say it, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, consider who? Who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. So I want to talk about endurance. When Jesus talked about the parable of the seeds, do you remember this parable? How many types of soil were there? There were four types. We want to be the fourth type. The fourth type is the type that fell on good soil. Look at it, verse 15, Luke chapter 8, verse 15. It says, the seed in the good ground, say that's me, Lord, make me good ground. The seed in the good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it and by what? Enduring, produce fruit. So if we're gonna be a fruitful people, we have to endure. So we're gonna look at a couple of definitions, and then we're going to talk about how do we endure. So endurance, this word that I said was used 32 times, this is what it means. Uh, cheerful constancy or patient continuance. Cheerful constancy or patient continuance. This is the long haul. This is the marathon. The body of Christ, we weren't made to sprint. Praise God, I was never a good sprinter. We weren't made to sprint. We were made 
for the pilgrimage. Blessed are those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. I'm looking at 120, (laughs) burning for Jesus. Amen? Cheerful constancy or patient continuance. So we are commanded to run our race with that kind of endurance. Cheerful constancy or patient continuance. And I don't know about you, but as I've read this, I'm like, I can't. I can't. I, I cannot. And I, I've been learning from the Lord that, that I can't is a really good starting place for him. You're in trouble when you can. That's when you're in trouble. So just go ahead and embrace your I can't. All right? Let's look at the beginning of this verse. So I want to talk to you about the ways how we endure. I feel like there's two main ways that we endure. The first is the beginning of this verse. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's the storyline of God. That's the history of God. That is scripture. Can you put up Romans 15 verse 4? Look at this, this is so awesome. For whatever was written in the past, okay, this is Paul writing Romans, he's talking about the Old Testament. Whatever was written in the past was written for our, talking about us, yes, our what? Our instruction, so that we might have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. So. We, we eat the scroll every day, not because we're trying to learn a theology, but because we're eating of the bread of life that is Jesus, and we're finding ourselves in the meta-narrative of God. And if you find yourself losing endurance or growing weary, maybe one key for you could be getting back into the meta-narrative of scripture that you lose your life somewhere in this big storyline of God. You have a place in there. So we can find hope through endurance in the scriptures. It talks all about that great cloud of witnesses. I had a dream years ago, I was running a race and I was running this race through this hot desert and there was dust all around me. I knew there were other people running the race with me. But how many of you know, like, you, 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 no, ain't nobody moving your legs for you. (laughs) You know, we, the, the, the Christian life is undoubtedly communal. Like, we have to do it together, but you also cannot depend on, like, these, you, these gotta move, right? And so in my dream, I was running this race. I'm in the desert and it's dusty and people are throwing rocks at me and cursing at me while I'm running. And I just kept taking courage that like I knew my friends were also running and they were getting thrown rocks at. And at the end of my race, I'm running and and I knew it was a long distance race because long distance races end with shoots at the end. It's not like a big, there may be a finish line, but you run into a chute. Anybody ever run a long distance race? So you, you, I ran into the chute and I saw Truman Spring, who if you don't know is one of our elders here and spiritual father to us. Um, I saw him at the end of my chute. He high-fived me uh, when I ran into the chute and I, I, I texted him last night. I said, I have good news. We both made it (laughs) and you made it before me. So that's even better. (laughs) Um, So we're called to run this race with endurance. And I'll be honest with you, in the last, I mean, I've been walking with the Lord for 17 years. And since we started up a room 13 years ago, there have been times where I have just not wanted to be running. I've just thought, this is the race that's been marked out for me. And I thought, I don't really like this. I don't want to do this. I don't think I'm very good at it. I don't think I'm going to make it. <clears throat> but I found someone. So I want to talk to you about him. 
because the scripture says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter. I want you to look at these two words. Look at the word author. And in this version, it says the pioneer, or he's the chief leader. Some versions say he's the source. Oh, I love that. He's the captain. He's the prince of your faith. He found you. Am I right? He called you. He authored something. Scripture talks about how we've been begotten of God, which means that we've been birthed by God. Now, I, Hannah, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Today's Hannah's birthday. This is my oldest. <laughs> So 12 years ago and uh, 10 hours ago, 12 years plus 10 hours, I birthed her. And let me tell you, she did nothing to help me. (laughs) I birthed her. And it was stinking hard. Uh, You were so worth it. Listen, scripture says that God birthed us. We've been born again, and you were just birthed like she was. And so this is what this speaks to, Jesus being the author or the source of your faith. Take comfort in that today, because he who began a good work, yeah, he's faithful. When we're faithless, he's faithful. So he's the author and the perfecter or the finisher or the consummation or the completer of our faith. Now I want to point out something here. This this verse doesn't say fix your eyes on your race. Fix your eyes on your call. Fix your eyes on your team. Fix your eyes on on your strength training. He says, fix your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on him. That's why Sarah Beth was singing this morning. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I'm rewriting that song because I need to see you. Fix your eyes on him. To fix, oh, look at you. To fix is to turn your eyes away from other things and to focus them or fix them on one thing. And I I have noticed in my own heart when I'm weary or I'm discouraged I noticed that my eyes veered a little bit. Can I tell you how subtle it can be? This is how subtle it can be. Man, I've been fixing my eyes on upper room. Hmm, that's not Jesus. He's here, he loves it, but he, upper room's not eternal. But he is. I've been fixing eyes on what I've been called to do. I've been fixing my eyes on how crappy I am at this. <laughs> I've been fixing my eyes on what someone did to offend me. I've been fixing my eyes on how someone let me down. I've been fixing my eyes on, I mean, there were earlier seasons in my life when I, I, I would fix my eyes on the people around me to fulfill me. It was, I could, you could go look up the sermon and when I used to fix my eyes on Michael, He's awesome, but he's not Jesus. <laughs> That's a word for the young person in here. So let me show you. I just want to show you in, the, in Scripture, because Romans 15 says that all of it was written for our our strengthening, our encouragement, and our endurance. I want to show you in scripture how Jesus authored and perfected faith in someone. I want to look at the life of Peter. (laughs) So 
You don't have to flip to all these places, I'll tell you when. But in, in Luke 5 is when, Peter, uh, when Jesus called Peter. He found him fishing. What does he say? What does Jesus say to him? Come follow me. This is Jesus authoring faith. He came and found him. He's like, come follow me. Actually, the way that he does it is so profound. I heard someone mention it when he, when he throws, have you seen that Chosen episode? It's my favorite when he throws his net to the other side. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, this messes me up. So, so this is Jesus authoring faith in Peter. I found you, come follow me. I will blow you away with how good I am. So, so Peter's like, leaves everything behind, goes and follows Jesus. Peter saw profound miracles, and he's in the inner circle. He went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, like he is in the inn. He, he's the only other human besides Jesus that walked on water. And like, we give him a hard time, but nobody else said, Lord, call me out there. If that's you, call me. And the Lord called him out there and he steps out of the boat and he is walking on water until what? Until his eyes divert. And he cries out, save me. And the Lord grabs him. His eyes just a little, whoa, it's quite stormy out here. What am I doing? I'm walking on water. Instead of the voice and the face of the one that called him. I want you to, I want you to go to Luke chapter 22. This is one of my favorite portions of scripture. Starting in verse 31. Let me just set it up. Jesus has been telling them, like, he's going to the cross. It's going to get really bad. You don't understand all that we've been working for these three years. This is gonna be painful. They don't get it. And there's this moment where Jesus looks at Peter in verse 31. He says, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But these are maybe the best words in scripture. (laughs) But I have prayed for you. He's doing that right now. Did you know that? He's doing that right now. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And, and then I think this sentence sums up the heart of new covenant prophecy. <laughs> and when you, when you've turned back, wait a minute, where am I going? <laughs> he just, he didn't, explicitly say, you're going to turn your back on me, buddy. But he already sees past, he prophesies right into his future and says, when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Peter's like, hang on a minute. Uh, Look at verse 33. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. This is Peter's endurance. This is Peter's zeal and his own, like, I got this. I'm ready. Remember, we walked on water, like, let's go. I tell you, Peter, he said, the rooster will not crow today until you deny three times that you know me. Now I want us to go to the moment that this happened. Look, later in the chapter, Peter's already denied him twice. And look in verse 59. This is the third time. Jesus has been arrested. You guys know the story. Then after about an hour, another kept insisting, this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately While he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What do you think Jesus was thinking? 
Why did he make eye contact with Peter? Hey, I already told you, I already knew this was gonna happen. When you come back, strengthen your brothers. It's, a thousand words were said in this look. I knew it already and I loved you anyway. I already saw how you would fail me and I've loved you anyway. And I have a calling for you. You know, right before this, they had been in the garden. And that's when he asked them to stay awake and pray and they couldn't. They couldn't. I just want you to hear me say today, church, you can't. You don't have what it takes. And like we, we, I don't know, we just worship with all our hearts and, and as we should. But we just have to remember it's all him. And you know, they were in the garden and then, the, and then, the, and then Judas comes and the troops come and they, they're ready to get Jesus and there's Peter's zeal again. He's like, takes out his sword and chops off a dude's ear. I think that's pretty brave, actually. Like, these are the religious elite and the, the ones coming, and he's like, I'm, I told you, Lord, I would go with you, and I'm defending you right now. But it, it just ran out. I don't know what mile it was, you know? Mile 10, he's like, I ran out. I denied him three times. And even, this is, this is really key. Even after he saw Jesus resurrected, he's still not there. Look at, look at the end of uh, the book of John, last chapter of the book of John. Oh. This is the beautiful moment where Jesus is restoring Peter, starting in verse 15. And he's, you know, you've probably heard people preach about how he's restoring those three times of denial by giving him another moment. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. It's beautiful. But look, look in verse 18. After they have this exchange, Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, he's talking to Peter, when you were younger, you would tie your belt yourself. Wait, where am I? When you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, this is another prophetic word. Hear this, is Jesus prophesying to Peter about his death. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Can, I can just feel his heart sink again. Man, but you were resurrected. <laughs> like I thought now we get to see everything that we dreamt of, but you're just telling me that it's about to be hard again. And he, look at what Peter does in verse 20. Peter turns around, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's writing this letter, John, the one who had leaned on his breast at supper. And Peter looks at John, looks back at Jesus and goes, but what about him? What about his race? Is he gonna have to run as far as me? Is his terrain as hard as mine? Does he have as many people cheering for him? Is he gonna beat me? And it is not until Jesus ascends and they wait in that upper room for 50 days and the Holy Spirit is poured out that then Peter becomes the man that he wanted to be. By the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of Jesus living inside of Peter, all of a sudden he becomes the zealous man that he wanted to be. He becomes the man that Jesus saw when you've returned. Strengthen your brothers. Why? Because 
We cannot do this on our own. Open the eyes of my heart. Listen, that, that Holy Spirit inside of you is magnetized to look at Jesus. It is, it is a new operating system that will give you an endurance not your own. I want you to look at two scriptures, uh, 2 Thessalonians, uh, what is it? <clears throat> there it is. Look at this. May the Lord direct your heart. Remember there's eyes in your heart? May the Lord direct your heart to God's love and Christ's endurance. Not Larissa's endurance. Aaron, it's not your endurance. It's whose endurance? It's Christ, the author and the finisher, the pioneer and the perfecter. It's his endurance inside of you. Oh, by faith, I want you to hear me today. You have the endurance of Christ in you. I want you to see something in the book of Revelation. Let me set this up. <clears throat> the same disciple, John, wrote the book of Revelation. He's 96, they think, when he wrote this book. All the other apostles have been martyred. All the dudes that he ran with, all martyred. History tells us that they tried to murder John by boiling him in oil, but he didn't die. And so they exiled him to the island of Patmos. He is 96. And I want you to see what he writes. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom and the what the endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus listen I have <laughs> I'm confident John knew that his endurance ran out a long time ago and here he is 96 all his buddies are gone he's about to have the craziest encounter that's the only part of scripture that like, not the only, but it's like the book that is forward looking. Are you with me? And he says, hey, I'm all by myself out here. I'm old. All my friends are gone. And my Lord is gone, but I have the endurance of Christ. So when we're called to run the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who both began something and already finished it. I'm telling you, when I have times where I feel gut punched in my faith, I'm like, Holy Spirit, turn my eyes, turn my eyes. Turn my eyes, fix my eyes, fix my eyes. That's why we make such a big deal of communion here, because we constantly want to set the Lord before you, that your eyes would be fixed on him. That your eyes would be fixed on the author and the finisher. I want you to see the second part of, yeah, thank you. Can you put the, um, the next verse of Hebrews 12 up? Uh, look at this. F for, uh, uh, the one before verse two. Thank you. For the joy that lay before him, he endured. 
I've been asking him, Lord, what was your joy? What was the joy? What was John's joy? What was Peter's joy? All these guys that had all these promises and like saw the power of God crazily move through their hands. What was the joy before him that they were all martyred? Hey, we like saw all the signs and wonders and then I died. <laughs> what was the joy? I want you to look at, in, I want you to look at something in Second Peter with me. Because Peter actually calls to mind the word that the Lord gave him. This is his last letter that he wrote. He was probably, this was, he was maybe in his 60s when he wrote this. Don't you theologians get mad at me. I think he was in his 60s when he wrote this. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. He says, mind you, he's about to die. He's writing all the most important things he can think of. For this very reason, make every effort. Oh, there is no striving, but make every effort <laughs> to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, Godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Skip down to verse 12. I want you to see why he's saying this. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you, or he says, I will always remind you about these things, even though you know them and you're established in the truth you now have. I think it's right. As long as I am in this bodily tent, remember, he's remembering what Jesus said to him. It's right that I wake you up with a reminder, since I know that I will soon lay aside my tent, as our Lord Jesus has indeed made clear to me. And I will also make every effort so that you're able to recall these things at any time after my departure. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm going to make sure you write this down. And the Larissa Miller in 2023 reads it so that she can have endurance, so that she can fix her eyes on Jesus, so that she can know my story. I'm in the great cloud. She can know my story, that I too, for the joy that was set before me. You know, Peter was crucified upside down. I don't even know how that works. <laughs> You're all picturing it now, aren't you? <laughs> how did that work? He didn't want to have the honor of being murdered the way his Lord was. <clears throat> but I've been asking, Lord, what was the joy? If it's not like, if it's not all the things that I wanted to happen. What about all my, what about those, those things that I prayed that didn't get answered the way that I wanted? What is my, what is my joy set before me? Because if I can know that, then I'm running. What was his joy? I wanna, I wanna propose today that whatever the joy was for Jesus is the same joy for me. And that this is not the ethereal, weird, hard to grasp joy of the Lord that is your strength, but it's actually something, the joy that was set before him. He saw something that was worth going through it all. And I need to know what that was. So I want you to look at John chapter 17. This is his high priestly prayer right before he leaves. Kind of like Peter, he's like, he's saying all the important things. And he's praying. And he's praying for his disciples here. Ha, ha, ha. 17 verse 13, he says, he's talking to his father. 
Now, listen, I don't know like how exactly it looked, but I know that all those disciples were listening, right? Because they were all in that room together and John wrote it down. So just to picture the setting, right? I don't know exactly, you know, were they at the table? I don't know, you know, but he's praying and they're all there. He's talking to the Father, they're all there. Yes? And he says in verse 13, now I'm coming to you, talking to his Father, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed or fulfilled in them. All these guys are gonna give their lives for the gospel. All these guys have a painful ending, glorious, and they have a painful journey. But Jesus is like, Father, I'm praying that they would have my joy actually completed or fulfilled in them. And then I want you to see I want you to see like what his ultimate desire was. Put up verse 24. He says, Father, now he's praying for all of us. Hey, say, Jesus prayed for me. Look at what he prayed. He says, Father, I want those you have given me. Everybody raise your hand and say, that's me. <laughs> I want those you've given me to be with me. Where I am so that they will see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. They had something they wanted us in on. They have something they want us in on and it is a joy set before us that that dims every other joy. It is, they shouldn't even be called the same word. For you to know that you were the joy set before him, the unbroken fellowship and communion with you was the joy set before him and is today the joy set before us. Are you guys following me? <laughs> Listen. I know the end of the story. I'm coming up. I'm coming up leaning. I'm coming up leaning. Misty Edwards has this old song. Um, and there's this phrase she says, if you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. She has this beautiful, I would go look it up if you want. It's, it's, it's called, I knew what I was getting into. Ooh. If you don't quit, you win. Listen, I, because of the role that I play, I know a lot of people's stuff in this room. <laughs> Not a lot, but, but I know some stuff. And I just wanna tell you, they're still in this room. They're still running. The righteous fall seven times, but what? They get up. Listen, our, our, our beloved King David, whose throne Jesus sits on, committed adultery and murder. But he didn't quit because his heart was tender toward his God. He repented. If you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. And so here's, here's the exhortation today. It's in the last part of our, our reading in verse, is it three or four? Uh, four. 
No, three, there you go. Consider him. Can you put up the definition of consider? To consider, to estimate, or to contemplate. It's worth pointing out, like, it's not, it's not consider, consider the kingdom of heaven so that you don't grow weary. It's not consider whatever. It's, it's specific. Consider him. Yeah. Contemplate him. Yeah. So that what? So that you don't grow weary and give up. Meaning that devil is prowling and he would like to wear you down so that you grow weary and you give up and you stop letting the eyes of your heart look to Jesus. You forget that you, you, you start thinking that it's up to you. You know, this, this word actually that you so consider him so that you don't grow weary and or grow discouraged in your souls. This word weary, it's very interesting. It's only used in two places. The other place it's used is in James chapter five. In James chapter five where it says, if any one of you is sick, same word. Well, what am I saying? I'm saying maybe, maybe a weary soul is a sick soul. If any one of you is Sick, call the elders of the church to anoint you with oil. Consider him. Consider him. Consider him. Man, when I don't know what to do, and I'm tired, and I'm weary, and I'm disappointed, so disappointed. I just say, Holy Spirit, help me consider him. Consider him. Consider how, it's like, Larissa, what are you saying? I'm saying like, consider him. Consider him that before the foundation of the world, he was there making a plan to redeem you. Consider him who was born of a virgin in a manger. Consider him that when the angel came, he said, good news, I bring you good news of great joy. Consider him when he was performing miracles, when he healed the woman with the issue of blood. Consider him when he's going to the garden and he says, not my will, but yours be done. Consider him when he's up on the cross and he says, it's finished. Or when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Or when, when they get to see him with his holes in his hands and his feet. Consider him. Consider him now exalted at the right hand of the Father and in glory. Consider him. Man, and your heart finds strength that you can't find on your own. It's a supernatural exchange. Consider him. The heart never gains strength by considering any other thing or one. Oh, isn't that awesome? I'd like for us to run through that shoot together, right? Some of us are going to go sooner than others. And I want us to run the race that's been marked out for us. And so I, if I can get the prayer team to come up, if I can get uh, someone to hop on the keys, that'd be great. I want to give you a few, like, these guys are actually going to have oil um, in reference to that James 5 scripture. I want you to listen carefully. I know, like, I know they're going to put up the sign to go kids, but just hang tight. Because if you sat through this whole thing and you never did business with God, you'd be wasting your time. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit. Where am I weary and discouraged? Where have my eyes gotten off of you? 
Where are my eyes fixed on me or on the person a few lanes down the track? This is the, here's the phrase the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, there are ones who are sidelined with shame that you feel you have disqualified yourself and you are paying penance on the sideline. And the Lord says, let's not waste any more time there. Where am I weary and discouraged in my soul? Where have my eyes been looking to my own strength, my own zeal, my own ability to endure? Where has my, where have I put joy before me that will come up short? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just close your eyes. On your worst day, you were the joy set before him. On your, in your ugliest moment, your ugliest thought, your grossest feeling, in your unbelief, in your faithlessness, you were the joy set before him. you to whisper back to him I'm the joy Lord let your gaze rest here Jesus and let me lift mine to you let your gaze rest here Jesus We consider you, we consider you, we consider you, we consider you, Jesus. We consider you. You've set eternity in our hearts and we turn them toward you, we consider you. You are the joy, Lord. You are the joy, Lord. You, Jesus, are the joy. You are the joy. You, with the Father and the Spirit, bringing us into communion. It's you. You are the joy, the fellowship. The fellowship, you are the joy, you are the joy, you are the joy, and I'm your joy, and you're my joy, you are the joy, God. Oh, da, 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 ba, da, da, da. just yield yourself to let the Lord tell you, you are the joy that was set before me. It's my delight to wash you, cleanse you, refresh you, strengthen you, renew you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh.
you can just keep this atmosphere, but if you wanna be prayed for, if your heart is weary or discouraged, we wanna pray for you. We wanna anoint you with oil so you can come up, but we'll just maintain this atmosphere and honor the Lord and how he's touching hearts. But we would love to pray with you. on staff or you are have been through our ministry school will you come pray for people please if you're an elder yeah thank you thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord your Holy Spirit thank you Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hey guys, I'm back. Thank you for tuning into our live stream. We love you so much. Before you go, I wanna encourage you, if you're watching at home with your family, maybe you're a father, a mother, or maybe you're just with friends, uh, circle up as a family, pray together, lay hands on one another, but don't just let this be something you're watching. Let it, let it grip you in your own home or in your car. Maybe if you're driving down the car that you could say a quick prayer over your family. I don't know what it looks like, but we're so grateful that you tuned in. We love you. We have live prayer throughout the week, so hopefully we see you again this week. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching The Upper Room.